Thank you all for coming out on a very cold night. Is that what we told you? Uh, I'm a neurologist with a specialty in sleep medicine. I'm going to talk to you in general about sleep. Um, basically, what I want to get across is how important it is, because many people just don't think it's that important. It's important for a lot of reasons, and also some things about improving your sleep and about some other sleeping problems. And this is just basically what I just talked about. That, you know, I'm going to give you some general information, and uh, I'll also give you some tips on when you might want to talk to a doctor if you have sleeping problems. Uh, I sometimes start by talking about jet lag, and it might not be what you think. The, the slide asks how many of you are jet lagged. Maybe some of you just traveled, but probably most of you didn't. But in fact, uh, there's a concept in sleep medicine called social jet lag, which is extremely common. And that's what this slide talks about, that if you sleep during the week, zero is midnight and 7 a.m., and you have a really good regular sleeping schedule, many of us go to bed later on weekends. If you go to bed three hours later on Friday, some people may do that, maybe more younger people than older people, but everybody <laughs> falls into that. Uh, but that's like jet lag, and um, that can cause problems. Okay, and I alluded to this before also, that I want to get across that cheating on sleep or not getting enough sleep isn't benign. It doesn't just make you sleepy. It's actually a very big public health problem. Um, and there's an important illustration which many of you probably remember. Uh, there was an unfortunate train crash in Hoboken just a couple of months ago, and initially they didn't seem to know what happened, but it turns out that the conductor actually had unrecognized sleep apnea. He had a very severe sleeping problem, but literally fell asleep at the wheel, and that's what caused the accident. So, you know, that's a dramatic example, but all of us need sleep to remain alert. Um, the, the brain does things during sleep that are important. The brain and the body are active during sleep. The body needs sleep to stay well and to heal, and you also need it to learn. And these are the things I'm going to be talking about. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about is, first of all, why do you sleep? I'll talk about normal sleep and what, uh, what that does for your learning and your general health. I'll talk about improving your sleep, because we could all use that. I'll talk a little bit about circadian rhythms. That's the jet lag phenomenon that I was talking about at the beginning, and also the last part will be about sleep disorders and when you might need to talk to a doctor about your sleep. Okay, so this is a picture of normal sleep. Sleep isn't just unconsciousness. Your brain actually goes through different stages of sleep that are important in different ways. So in this, uh, this picture here is a map of a normal night's sleep. Um, the little W here is awake. The R is what we call REM sleep, and then these numbers are deepening uh, sleep of other stages. So what happens is initially the, a normal person will fall asleep within a few minutes, get into deep sleep, <coughs> then go through REM sleep, deep sleep again, REM sleep, deep sleep, different cycles like this throughout the night. So this is what most people need, and it does depend on age. Um, very young children, newborns, they sleep up to 18 hours per day. And as children get older, they need less sleep. But even teenagers, we think, need up to 10 hours. How many of them actually get that? Um, but we, that's what is really required. And adults, you know, many people think you don't need that much sleep. But uh, it's pretty clear that most people need an average of eight nights or eight hours of sleep per night. In terms of how much sleep people actually get, this country on the whole is sleep deprived. This was uh, a, a study done by the National Sleep Foundation looking at the average amount of sleep. And in this uh, study, they were actually looking at ethnicity to see if there were differences. But basically, in every ethnic group, uh, during the week, the sleep was less than what we think you need, seven hours. And even on weekends, many groups uh, got barely seven hours or even less. Uh, 
And this is just from the same study uh, showing how many of the people who get less than, if they get very little sleep, less than six hours, most think they, they don't, they're not getting enough sleep. But even a lot of people that get six to eight hours think they're getting plenty of sleep. Probably many of you think the same thing. So why do we sleep? Well, I'm going to try to convince you again this is important. Obviously, if you don't get enough sleep, we all know we can be drowsy. But it's important to learn. So especially children, if they're not getting enough sleep, they don't learn as well. Uh, there are effects on the immune system and on diseases. And those are some of the other things I'm going to talk about. OK, so why do people sleep? Well, one example uh, we don't really know. But one example I bring up is dolphins. So why do I have a dolphin here? You probably can't see it very well. Well, um, we know that sleep is important not only in people, but in, in animals too. Animals have to learn. And if you think about it, a dolphin lives in the water, but is a mammal. How do they sleep if it's necessary? Well, it's very complicated what has happened. Dolphins sleep one half of their brain at a time. They go through the same stages that I talked about, the, the dream sleep, the deeper sleep, on one half. The other half stays awake so they can come up and they can breathe and they can avoid the sharks. So for some reason, nature thought it was so important that that's how an animal like that sleeps. I'm going to show you a couple of studies uh, that try to tell you what happens if you don't get enough sleep. This one. I might uh, jump ahead and let you, let you translate part of it. Um, but this is a study in normal people uh, looking at what happens with different amounts of sleep, disrupt with sleep restriction. So some people got no sleep for several days, but other groups got restricted sleep, six hours per night, which most, most of us may think is OK. But this will show you that it really wasn't. So this is the important slide. It's a little um, complicated, but what it shows is what happens after sleep, dis sleep deprivation in relationship to it alertness, to attention. That's, this is a scientific test that measures alertness. And what the study showed is first these uh, diamonds here. This is eight hours of sleep, so this is really normal. People don't make mistakes on this test when they get eight hours of sleep. So we'd expect that. This group got no sleep for three days. They started making lots and lots of mistakes. Their attention was terrible. We would expect that. But the important point is this one. This is six hours of sleep. Uh, and initially, they did OK. But after they went on and on for six or eight or 10 days with only six hours of sleep, they got worse and worse. And that's what you see when you, when you restrict your sleep. Uh, OK, so uh, this is another example of a memory test. And you know, we all think memory is very important, so I'm going to show you a couple of these. This is remembering words. And what they did in this test is took normal people, and they were either sleep deprived, had no sleep for 36 hours, or had slept normally the night before, and they had to learn words. Uh, pairs of words. And uh, it's going to become important, but some of them were neutral words, like, you know, chair, floor. Uh, some of them were positive things, like, you know, maybe birthday and cake, um, or negative things, things that would be bad. And then they had to come back and see what they remembered. So what they found is um, if you look across all the words, uh, what happened is if you were sleep deprived, you're you did much, much worse, almost twice as bad in, in terms of how well you could remember things. Um, but most of the difference was actually in the positive group. The positive words were the, the hardest ones to remember. And if any of you have been sleep deprived and found yourself being negative, not remembering the good things, or having your, your spouse complain about, you know, why do you keep bringing up the bad things, this might be it. You just don't remember the good things as well when you're sleep deprived. Uh, so the point here is that uh, lear we know learning doesn't happen as well if you're sleep deprived. And specifically, positive things are less well learned 
But the negative things you tend to remember, and I didn't show you this, but if you get sleep afterward, it's too late. You don't suddenly remember them. You have to have, go into learning having enough sleep. Okay, what about health? Uh, I talked about memory. Well, humans need sleep for that too. And in this case, uh, again, healthy people who uh, measured their sleep for 14 days and then they got a, inoculated with a rhinovirus. They got a, a bit of cold virus actually put in their nose. So they got directly exposed to a cold virus. And then they were placed in, in a laboratory to see if they actually got symptoms, clinical signs. Uh, but it might also contribute to weight gain, which is another big problem. And this is getting back to the social jet lag that I was talking about before. That is a way that people's sleep is disrupted. And when this was looked at in relationship to body mass index, this is a measure of weight. And uh, what happened is if you, if you measure how much of this social jet lag sleep disruption people get, as it got to be over three hours, the chances of being uh, obese were, were higher. Um, it, it was okay. The good news is if your weight is normal, it didn't really seem to have an effect. But if you're starting out overweight, the more sleep disruption you got from this jet lag, the more likely you were to get heavier and heavier. Okay, so sleep is important, again, to prevent drowsiness for your overall health, immune system, and probably other areas, memory, weight control. And I didn't mention this last one, but there are studies that show if you're well rested, you're more attractive. People think you look better. Okay, so now I want to talk about how you improve your sleep, which is maybe why a lot of you are here. Uh, a couple of general things. <coughs> One is, it's pretty obvious, you can't force yourself to go to sleep. And, you know, people think you can. They, they come to me and, and ask how they can force themselves to go to sleep. It's not possible. But what you can do is work on what we call sleep hygiene. That's improving your sleep habits and your sleep environment. And also working with the natural systems in your body to help your sleep. And many of th these things are pretty obvious, but people don't think about them. Like, uh, like this one, avoiding coffee, tea, and cola, um, but also chocolate. Chocolate has a lot of caffeine in it, a caffeine-like substance. And so that could be what keeps people up at night. So that's why I have to give you a long list of things to think about. Yeah, these are all the relaxation techniques. But those are all very individual, too, what can help your mind to turn off. So uh, I also gave you a list of some examples of apps. Some, some people like one, some people like another, but they're, they're different ways of training you. Some of them use sound, some of them use talking, um, some of them use breathing, but that can help, too. Uh, many of you have probably heard of the the devices that track your sleep. Some of you may actually use them. Those can be helpful, but they also can be misleading. Does anybody use one of those? Uh, like a, a Fitbit or something on your phone that tracks your sleep? This is all about that. And jet lag, if I have, I think this is in the handout as well, if any of you want uh, guidelines for helping you if you travel. I think I talked a lot about insomnia from the questions, but uh, so this may go a little bit quickly, but it's very common. Um, usually what we think about is, we call it psychophysiological, because basically your brain has learned to stay awake when it's not supposed to. <laughs> um, and you know, your brain, remember your brain is designed to keep you up at night if you need to stay up. If, you're, if you have a sick family member, if you have an emergency, your brain can do that. It's supposed to do that. What's abnormal is if it's doing it all the time. And then the treatment is to unlearn that response. That's why it takes time. So uh, the treatments, I always recommend behavioral treatments. And the idea is to unlearn that to uh, reverse this bad habit. So one is called stimulus control therapy. That's to avoid uh, activating your brain when you're in bed. So you only go to bed when you're sleepy. 
you don't stay in bed wide awake because it trains your brain to stay awake. If you're, if you're not sleepy, you leave the bed, in, bed or bedroom and do something quiet until you're able to sleep. Uh, the, the more uh, difficult one is what's called sleep restriction. That's for people who spend long time in bed without being asleep. So the idea is to stop that, you restrict to no more than 30 minutes over your estimated sleep time. So if you're spending 12 hours in bed, but you're only sleeping for seven, you're spending all that time awake, the, what this would have you do is you, you only spend eight hours in bed, even if you're awake for five of them, and then you have to get up. And you keep doing that until the time in bed is mostly asleep. Um, so that is uh, a therapist I mentioned. There are a couple that you can do online. Uh, you can learn that sleep restriction, for instance. There are online therapy sessions that some people use. Other techniques I've recommended, one is learning hypnosis. That's online. Uh, this is one example, or you can go to a therapist for that. Uh, in fact, I think it was in the New York Times today about using hypnosis. It can be good for some things. And easier for a lot of people is using yoga or meditation, other ways of turning down your brain. Some of you may have heard about using blue, uh, what blue lights do to your sleep. That can be a problem too. Blue lights activate more than other frequencies. Um, so that affects your melatonin for one thing and can interfere with going to sleep. Um, so where do we get blue light? Smartphones and computers. The new smartphones actually have a setting that you can, you can put on, so at a certain time it dims the blue. But the easy way is to use uh, blue blocking glasses. You can get them online, anywhere, uh, that just take out the blue frequencies. But that, that's not to say you should be on your computer working, surfing, chatting. That will wake you up with the blue light or not. Um, there are medicines for sleep also. Uh, I always recommend behavioral treatment, but uh, some people get over-the-counter medicines. Most of these have diphenyramine, which is an antihistamine. Um, some people use alcohol, which is never a good idea. It doesn't really help you get to sleep. It actually can interfere with your sleep. Um, some over-the-counter uh, medicines have these things in them, herbals and so forth. Those might be helpful. Um, so, but these are pretty benign. If they help you, that's okay. And then there are prescriptions, which I'm not going to talk a lot about because you'd always have to talk to a doctor about those, obviously. But they can help, especially if they used along with the behavioral treatment. And I think the way to use medicine is, again, to try to train your brain, not to take it forever. It's not going to force you to go to sleep, but it might help get better sleep patterns. Okay, uh, other problems. So these are, these are the other ones that I wanted to talk about. So when might you need to talk to a doctor? If you're, you still have t trouble with insomnia or you're still sleepy, non-restorative sleep, even though you do all the training things I talked about, you might want to talk to a doctor. <coughs> Signs of sleep apnea. This is another common problem interfering with sleep. Snoring, if you're sleepy during the day, even though you're getting enough sleep, or if you wake up with a headache, those are signs that you might have sleep apnea. And then some other problems, sleep walking, sleep eating, uh, hallucinations, uh, that, that, that's a dream image when you're, when you're actually awake, or acting out of dreams. There's a sleep disorder where people may get out of bed or they might start fighting because they're dreaming about being chased or, or in a fight. Those are signs you might need to talk to a doctor. Okay, so how do we measure sleep? If you see a doctor and you, they, he, he or she thinks you might have a sleeping problem, we do a sleep study. And this is an example of uh, one in the laboratory, although sometimes they're done just uh, as an outpatient. You can take the device home. What we measure is uh, your breathing, usually at the nose, measure your breathing at the chest, and there's a measurement of oxygen. These are all looking for sleep apnea but also we look at brain activity to see what your sleep itself looks like and if there's anything uh, irregular going on there. Uh, 
Okay, uh, this is an example. I showed you it early, a normal sleep. This is someone from the laboratory that had a lot of sleepiness despite sleeping a lot. And the difference from what I showed you before is you can see rather than going to sleep and just going in and out of uh, deeper and lighter sleep, this person is waking up very frequently. Uh, so what else we found was something called periodic limb movements. So that's shaking movements of the legs that can actually wake you up during, or partly wake you up without you even realizing it. Um, the, this patient was also taking a medicine called Prozac, which decreases dream sleep. So it was complicated. She probably, she had these limb movements which weren't treated, and that was part of it, but also um, was having problems with insomnia. Um, actually <coughs> slept better in the lab than she did at home. Okay, so just to summarize what to do about your sleep. Again, sleep is not automatic. You need to work with your body to improve your sleep. Um, I didn't really talk about incorporating cues for sleep directly, but that's one of the things that these exercises do. Your body learns that it's almost like uh, it's, an, it's an automatic response. Your body learns that when you take the tea, when you listen to the tape, it starts to train you, this is, this is the time to go to sleep. So those can be helpful. Uh, you want to encourage sleep at night and encourage wakefulness during the day with the techniques that I've talked about. And the ways to do this may be behavior modification. Some people use meditation, these other techniques like aromatherapy, yoga, and so forth, medications, whether they're prescribed or non-prescribed. 